Hi, everyone. Thank you for your patience, and welcome to Voices, a library lecture series. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred homelands of the Mahikiniak or Mohican people who are the stewards of this land. Today, the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present. Voices presents timely and enduring speakers on timely and enduring issues each semester to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Please fill out a survey at the link on our first slide or on our social media platforms. These help to inform our future programming. Today, Voices presents Dr. Gertrude B. Hutchinson, DNS, RN, MA, MSIS, CCRNR. Currently an assistant professor of nursing at Russell Sage College, she previously worked as the director of history and education and as an archivist at the Center for Nursing at the Foundation of New York State Nurses. Dr. Hutchinson earned her Doctor of Nursing Science in Leadership and Education from the Sage College's School of Health Sciences. An MA in History, MS in Information Systems, both from, the SUNY, both from SUNY Albany, a BA in History from California State University, and her Diploma in Nursing from United Hospital School of Nursing. Her areas of research focus on nursing, women's, and oral history, military nursing, nursing education. She has presented and published widely on her research. Please welcome Dr. Gertrude Hutchinson. Good afternoon, everyone. And Anne, thank you for that lovely introduction. It is wonderful to be here on this sacred land, even though it is virtual from this beautiful studio complex on the Hudson Valley Community College campus and to participate in the annual Voices Library series. I must acknowledge some of my research was conducted at the Bellevue Alumni Association Archive at the Center for Nursing History in Gilderland, and there is no conflict of interest in presenting my research. All right. One of the first rules of nursing I share with my students is flexibility. So I'm going to be looking at the evolving role of nurses um, over 100 years of, pa of multiple pandemics. Each one of these pandemics in today's talk could be a presentation unto itself. However, in the brief time we have, I'll be discussing commonalities of seven epidemics and pandemics experienced between 1918 and the present. The societal, public health, and nursing responses, common political themes, and lessons learned from the past, which are informing our present and will hopefully impact our future. This first slide is a little busy, but it talks about the mortality statistics from 1918, where worldwide there were 500 million deaths, and what the breakdown is for deaths in the United States of the 1918 flu pandemic, the avian flu, SARS, swine flu, and currently statistics that I just retrieved this morning from the Johns Hopkins University website where cases worldwide are 29,316,738, 6,555,408 in the United States. And worldwide, the death toll is 929,236. U.S. deaths stand at 194,000 and a half, and New York State deaths, 33 plus thousand, and recoveries, importantly, at over 75,000. So you can see how virulent all of these pandemics have been. But by far, COVID is the top one. So let's get started talking about the global pandemic of 1918, the Spanish influenza. The Spanish flu came to the shores of the United States from both coasts as soldiers who were already ill or who were silent carriers returned following their tours of duty 
in the Great War or after the cessation of the hostilities. The greatest preponderance of our GIs returned through the Verrazano Narrows, past Our Lady of Liberty, to the shores of New York City, and on September 1st, excuse me, September 15th, 1918, New York City and New York State realized its first influenza death. John Barry discovered during the research for his book, The Great Influenza, that the Tammany Hall political machine still ran New York City and its health department. And its current then head, Royal Copeland, was a close friend of Mayor John Highland, a dean of a homeopathic medical school who, interestingly enough, had no medical preparation, education, or credentialing as a physician. Copeland denied the presence of the flu, calling it by other respiratory disease names. Quarantining and hospitalizations for the ill, though, eventually were called for, but as the statistics of morbidity and mortality rose, Copeland publicly stated this, quote, that the disease is not getting away from the control of the health department, but is decreasing, end quote. As cases grew, New York City was to say the least terrified. Now, are you hearing some similar themes to political espousals during the early days of COVID-19 in our country? Even as the death toll mounted in New York City in 1918, the powers that be in Tammany and in the New York City Health Department, on the instructions of Copeland, the counting of deaths were ordered to be stopped. Why? Because the deaths had hit 30,000. Are you hearing echoes again about curtailing testing on a national level? If the numbers mount and we stop counting them, do we have a true picture? In the first two months of 1920, during a resurgence of the Spanish flu, 11,000 influenza-related deaths occurred in New York City and in Chicago. And in New York City alone, a single day of reported cases exceeded any one single day in 1918. Take a moment to think about that and take that in. In the resurgence, one single day death rate exceeded one single day in the entire 1918-19 flu pandemic. In her consultant work for the American Journal of Nursing in 1957, the general director of the National Organization for Public Health Nursing, Dorothy Deming, noted that in the six weeks of Spanish flu hitting New York City, that New York City reported 93,297 flu cases, 12,369 pneumonia cases, and 12,356 deaths. In total, depending on which source you look at, worldwide, 25 million souls lost their lives in 1918-1919 alone. So here on this slide, we have some of the public health responses. From the middle of the 20th century to the end of the 21st decade, we have seen approximately six epidemics and pandemics, ranging from the Hong Kong flu of 1957 to avian, two bouts of swine flu, severe acute respiratory syndrome known as SARS, and Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome known as MERS. All of these are H&N viruses or COVID of some type. And COVID-19, as we saw from that second slide, is currently the most, le most lethal. These images that you see on this slide are from previous pandemics and also from current 
efforts to encourage social distancing, to encourage proper respiratory hygiene. So the stance of the public health department and how we can mitigate against spread is not new. Common to all of these illnesses are their symptoms and their comorbidities or causes, underlying causes that would make someone susceptible. So you have comorbidities throughout all of the pandemics, such as asthma, heart disease, diabetes, both types one and two, neuromuscular diseases, being over the age of 65, being immunocompromised or pregnant. And what are the symptoms? Well, we're familiar with them by now. They're chills, fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose, body aches or fatigue, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. And one of the things that set COVID apart was a very early or prodromal um, loss of sense of smell. How do you diagnose it? The same way, through nose and throat swabs. All throughout the pandemics, these were done. Oh, excuse me. This is very sensitive. Sorry. Okay. Um, these, are all, these were all um, done through all the different pandemics. Treatment was rest, encouraging fluids, clear, clear liquids such as broths, over-the-counter pain relievers, and antipyretics. And interestingly, um, the Atlanta Journal in their then and now column took a look back at some um, homemade remedies of 1918, which I thought you might find quite interesting. Flea dip that you would use on your dogs. You dip a person in flea dip to kill the flu. Quinine bisulfate, putting sulfur in their shoes, or garlic and onions. For more serious cases, once Tamiflu and Relenza came on the market, those were given to patients with a, most, a more serious uh, case of the flu. And how do you prevent it? Well, one, you stay New York tough by hand washing with soap or sanitizer. You don't touch your nose or your mouth or your eyes because these are sites where entry of the virus can set up shop within the body. And it was up to the public health services nationwide and public health nurses to spread the word and engage the populace by complying with all that was asked on all of these posters. As during the current pandemic, these nurses stressed the need for masking and hand washing, social distancing and quarantine, which we now call self-isolation, and screening. In my research, I found that in 1918, there was pushback against these non-invasive measures, just as there are currently. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution published an interesting statement from someone in San Diego, California in 1918 regarding pushback. Many in San Diego did not like the idea of masking because pretty girls would have, be having to hide their faces behind the masks. So what are society's and everyday's responses? Depending on who you are, you might have the opportunity to work at home, as we have found. But Everyday life in 1918 didn't give that option. You have to remember there was the Great War, World War I, going on. 
So people did not have the option to stay home. They had to go to work. And just as we need our infrastructure of important personnel now, such as maintenance, environmental personnel, trash haulers, cooks, grocers, delivery systems, and drivers, transportation, such as cabbies, bus drivers, subway and rail personnel, traffic and beat officers, so too. Those jobs were vital in 1918 through 1920 to keep our country running. As I said, most many of the men were away overseas in Europe fighting the Great War. So how did the general republic respond? And how did these workers respond? Well, we already talked about a little bit about the pushback you know, of, of masking and social distancing. But for the most part, they put on their PPE, rolled up their sleeves, and got to work. They wore their masks, as you can see. The, um, the slide, the gentleman on the left is um, a street cleaner. In the middle, you have a traffic cop. And you have a travel advisory from the current COVID-19 pandemic. And again, another poster of how to, to keep and to curtail the spread of germs. So were they scared? Sure. Absolutely they were. If you read any of um, primary source material about the day, yes, they were scared, but they also took it as part of their patriotic duty while other men were away serving at war that they would serve on the home front. Similar to today, if you look and have listened to any of the, the news of today, when people have been interviewed of why are you here, because I have to. I have to support my family. I have bills to pay. So again, those common themes were, have been running out through all of these pandemics and epidemics. And as we are discovering, our pastimes are very important. What have you been seeing in the news currently, talking about opening up the athletics for the fall, fall football? Baseball. Basketball's been in the bubble in Orlando. Baseball's been in the bubble. How do you complete the Stanley Cup playoffs? All of these things that have been going on. And they're still important. And they've always been important because they take us out of our everyday concerns, if just for a brief time, to forget about what's going on. So the same thing was true in 1918. But it was tricky to navigate that. And we learned from many of our sports heroes from a century ago. Now, um, Governor Cuomo's picture came up here because he was also admonishing us in everyday life to you know, stay healthy, giving us updates every day of what was going on. And he's still giving us updates about schools opening up and about sports. So here we go, our national pastime, baseball. In 1918, players, you know, both in, in the battery and umpires were masked, and the fans were masked. And if you see from the third or the second gentleman um, from the right and the first gentleman from the right sitting on the bleachers are in their military uniforms. So they knew that they needed to mask in order to be able to play. And today, the same thing. Baseball players are masking. Not always in the outfield, and unfortunately, I've seen pictures with them not necessarily masking in the dugout, which doesn't curtail spread. But they try to keep the masks on because they know about curtailing spread. Okay. But the fans, fans are a little different today. They're not real people. They're images. 
So that's something that, that we've learned in the social distancing. So what has been nursing's response to all of this? We talked about the public health nurses in previous slides, but what was their response? In 1918 and 1919, the basics of nursing care involved following Nightingale's admonitions for rest, comfort, clean air, clean water, good nutrition, following known sanitation principles, and allowing family to be with patients, if at all possible, especially in their final hours. So her environmental theory was really put into use in 1918. One other thing that was much different in 1918 from today is that much of the nursing care occurred at home. People had private duty nurses. They would pay nurses to come into their home to take care of their loved ones. However, during the surge of flu cases in 1918 and 1919, families were really reticent to let nurses leave their loved ones doing private duty. They, and in many cases, there's been documentation where families would say, no, you can't leave. I'm not allowing you to leave this house. So basically holding private duty nurses as hostage. And in the newspapers, there were, you know, calls for the fact that nurses needed to go overseas to treat injured servicemen. So there were shortages in hospitals. There were shortages in homes to take care of patients. And basically, patients didn't go to the hospitals much in that day because if they went to the hospitals, they died. So it wasn't until after World War II that there was really a, the big push to you know, have acute care hospitals as we know them today. But as I say, the families did not want to let private duty nurses go, even if it was to the fact that the private duty nurses had sick family members that they needed to care for. So this compounded, as I said, the shortage of qualified nurses to care for hospitalized or quarantined patients. So they tried to develop large quarantine spaces. And the slide on the left side of the screen is showing such. Um, this is the Oakland Municipal Arena in Oakland, California, that was set up as a giant flu ward. So you see nurses in their cover aprons with masks, and they were trying to socially distance the patients. So it enabled a small amount of, a small number of nursing staff to care for many patients. And as with COVID-19, we saw in New York City, they built the Javits Center, okay? It was turned into a similar type situation of a quarantine or an overflow hospital, if you will. But there were many other registered nurses who were eager and prepared to help, not only in the war effort and caring for the GIs, but they're also ready to help underserved and rural areas of our country to combat the flu pandemic. And those nurses for whom I speak were our African American sisters, black sisters who because of a lack of segregated housing in the European theater, in the words and practices of the American military at the time, could not be deployed overseas. And I have to say that thanks goes to Ida Bell Samuel Toms, who was a Lincoln Hospital School of Nursing um, graduate, who was also founder of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, because she was the champion for the Army um, enlisting African American nurses. And here you see nine of the nurses on the right who were considered the Black 18 as they were called. They um, were sent to Camp Sherman in the United States. And instead of being able to serve in the military, they served taking care of flu pandemic patients. All over the country, the Red Cross eventually 
um, also sent African American nurses to underserved areas um, to take care of coal miners in Kentucky and West Virginia and people in rural areas of the South. Nurses were mobilized to many areas of our country in 1917 and 1918, and as we experienced here in New York City during the COVID-19 surge, nurses came from all over the United States to aid our New York nurses to care for the critically ill. Convalescent patients who could go home were rapidly discharged to open up more acute care beds. And when the numbers started to fall in, in New York State, we returned the favor by traveling to other hard hit states to give the same aid to brother and sister nurses. Aid that we benefited from, so we were paying it forward. And that happened in other um, pandemics as well. Nurses were mobilized to, you know, for vaccine clinics in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And as we saw in the swine flu epidemic in 1976, that there was a big push for vaccines. Similar to what we're hearing now, the testing wasn't as rigorous. The vaccine was rushed into production. And there were cases of Guillain-Barre, which is a, a neuromuscular disease, in many in the population as a result of that. So the, the conversations that are going on now about testing of vaccines is so important and that the vaccines are going to do what we need them to do when they are ready for the COVID-19. So you see there's a lot of similarities that we're drawing from previous experiences. And Hudson Valley, just as Russell Sage, has its nursing department here. So as the pandemic hit our shores in 1918, again in 1957, and so forth, and currently, my thoughts turned to the fact that nursing students were not exempt from experiences of caring for our pandemic-stricken population. As a nursing student at Presbyterian Hospital in New York City in 1918, Dorothy Deming, who I previously have referenced in her research and work for AJN as a consultant, recalled vividly her experiences. And she said, one day, our student duties and classes went on as usual. Then, almost overnight, the hospital was inundated by flu victims. Wards were hastily emptied of convalescent patients. Cots appeared down the center of wards and down corridors. Treatment rooms became bedrooms. And nurses were reassigned. Vac vacations were canceled. Leaves and classes disrupted for us students. A night without a death became exceptional. And our heartbreaking report one morning was seven deaths in eight hours. Think about that for a moment. One person died an hour. That's really tough to take when you're a seasoned professional, let alone when you're a nursing student. We don't know if this was the first time that Deming might have seen a patient die. That's a really tough thing for a nursing student. It's a tough thing for a professional registered nurse if they hadn't experienced that in their educational journey. But one person an hour. And you can extrapolate, if you multiply that across the country, how many deaths there were just in one eight-hour shift. 
And think about this in light of what we're experiencing now during this current COVID pandemic. We've seen pictures from China, from Italy, from Brazil, from the UK, where hospitals are running out of room to care for the ill, running out of ventilators, running out of morgue space. We saw this in our own New York State, having to create morgue space in refrigerated trucks. Family members not being able to be there at the last moments of their loved one's lives. Not being able to be present for funerals or having to have mass funerals. It's a very sobering, very, very sobering situation. In 1918, Deming continues, we had no miracle drugs, no antibiotics, no oxygen or suction equipment at every bedside. Our care for patients was mainly supportive. We gave heart and respiratory stimulants or sedation as their condition and stage of the disease deteriorated. I was one of the few students in my class who remained perfectly healthy throughout the epidemic. I was, however, almost fanatic about hand washing and did my best to get extra sleep and plenty full meals. And here, this slide is showing Red Cross workers making influenza masks for soldiers in Boston. And what do we see today? The use of personal protective equipment. This group has been working together so they were not socially distanced for this, these two photos of current day. But if you look at the commonalities, the, perfect, the personal protective equipment was the same. Hand washing is the same. Covering your face when you cough is the same. These are lessons that we've learned from these pandemics. So, in conclusion, because I want to leave time for questions, what have we as nurses learned from a century of pandemics? What has the global population learned from a century of pandemics? What have the citizens of New York State learned from a century of pandemics? Or maybe you think I should ask this question. Have we learned anything from a century of pandemics? I submit to you that yes, we have. We have learned a lot. Nurses are at the center of patient care and in the center of collaboration with advanced practice nurses and other healthcare providers, such as physicians, physician's assistants, public health officials, community volunteers, local, state, and national leaders steeped in infectious disease protocols, the public can, does, and will receive the education needed to inform them about the best and current standards of practice and care. We proffer the information and hope it falls on fertile soils where we all learn and improve healthcare practices to defeat the pandemics. It has worked in the past. We can look back at the pictures. We can look back at the statistics. We have the evidence to support our current practices. Are we in uncharted waters? Absolutely. Are we learning things every day? Absolutely. 
are we as nurses and as citizens of the United States required and needing to be flexible? Absolutely. But in all of this, we're continuing the improvement of our present and cultivating knowledge for our future. We can do this. Working together with nurses at the center and with everyone doing their part, however big, however small, we can do this. And we will learn from this pandemic moving into the future. I want to thank you for the time that you have given to listen to this presentation. And these are the lessons that we have learned closing out. The importance of health education. The importance of thinking of others as well as ourselves. When I think about the pushback that came from in 1918 and various other pandemics and epidemics and currently about wearing face masks, we're protecting not only ourselves, but we're protecting each other. And the importance of personal hygiene. These are lessons we learned as kids. To wash your hands, to cover your mouth when you cough. And we need to utilize those frequently throughout every day. So again, I want to thank you for listening. I hope you take to heart some of the lessons that I have shared. And I now have time for questions. Thank you. Oh, OK. Great. Some questions have come in. OK. All right. All right, I'm just looking. Some four really good questions have come in here. So I don't know in which order they came in. I'll just take them from the top. Um, thank you, Ann, for these. First question is, who is taking care of nurses to keep them healthy? Very good question. This year, 2020, has been designated as the International Year of the Nurse and the International Year of nurse midwives. Who's taking care of the nurses? Basically, we are. Uh, we encourage self-care, which is meaning taking time for ourselves. Um, many hospitals have set up what they have called zen rooms or quiet rooms where nurses can go and take time out. They can get recharged. They can sit in the quiet. Um, hanging out with your friends really isn't an option, but pre-conferences, post-conferences, being there for each other. There has been a big surge in the imp continued and mounting importance of mental health nurses. So that's one of the ways that we take care of ourselves to keep us healthy. So how has, um, how has COVID-19 changed the way we educate our nursing students? That's a very interesting question. And it was one that was very challenging. And I'd like to share from the experience at Russell Sage College, when the pandemic struck, we were on, well, the, the lockdown, we were on spring break. So we expen extended spring break for one week for the students. During that time, not only our faculty, but faculty from all over nursing um, colleges all over the nation and nursing schools were, you know, hustling to figure out how we're going to do this. Um, we had to get buy-in from the New York State Ed to change our plans. And we went virtual. We did virtual simulations for clinicals to get our senior students graduated. We did virtuals for our juniors 
to get their clinical hours in. We did virtuals for our 200 level, our first level nursing students to make sure that they got their clinicals. All of our classes were online through Zoom or Blackboard or many other platforms that allowed for interaction between us and our students. Moving forward this semester, as with many other programs, our theory courses, are the lecture parts, are online for the first six weeks. Our students are in clinical settings. They are following COVID criteria. They have all been tested. We have all been tested. And many other schools in the nation are following this same way and using simulation also. Um, and that's one of the advantages of really having all of this technology that they didn't have in 1918. In 1918 and even in the 1950s, students were right there taking care of the patients. So they were exposed as much as anybody was. The difference, the question, the next question is, what is the most significant difference between the 1918 pandemic and the COVID-19 pandemic? Many things. One is that the news cycle is now 24 seven. So we are connected all over the world in a way that we weren't connected in 1918. So the country may not have known what was going on with the number of flu deaths in 1918 the way they do now. That's one. The virulence of this pandemic, the loss of life, the comorbidities, the sequelae, in other words, what's left that you're dealing with after the pandemic is over, we're finding. Um, these are different than they were in the 1918 flu pandemics. They're different than they were in 1976, even in 2009 with the swine flu. So that's what we're finding out. We have better PPE. While it's similar, you looked at those pictures and there were nurses who had their masks on, who had cover gowns on. We didn't have, um, as Dorothy Deming said in 1918, we didn't have oxygen at everybody's bedside. We didn't have ventilators. That's a big difference, is the spread of, of you know, the vast spread of the technology that's available to us. And if you think back, that's, that burst of technology started with the space race in the 60s. Another question came in, what did World War, did World War I affect the accessibility of PPE and medical equipment? In my research, I have not found any specific information that deals with that. I can theorize that it probably did. But as we saw that one picture of the Red Cross making masks, they were not only doing those masks to send overseas, but they were also making those masks to use stateside. So there were Red Cross chapters all over the country who were making masks. You know, for the war effort, they were knitting socks for the GIs. But they would have retooled and really you know, honed in on this because nurses were crucial to taking care of the sick and the ill. So there may not have been, but I just don't specifically know the answer to that question. Any other questions? Sure, if I have time. Do I have time for one more? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, messages to the public um, are dominated by political leaders. 
Even Dr. Fauci's messages are interpreted as political. In past pandemics, who delivered public health messages? Um, and what is the long-term effects of politicized public health messages? Good question. Um, in the past, um, as I alluded to, you know, uh, Royal Copeland during the 1918 flu pandemic gave updates for the New York State Health Department and the New York City Health Department. So there's always been a political bent to any of these pandemics. Um, and there's always been, you know, thinking back in, in my lifetime um, with the 1976 swine flu, and it was an election year, so you have many of the constellations of events in 76 that you also have currently. Um, and so there were members of um, the FDA. There were members of the military giving updates. You had the presidents giving updates. Um, in, in, you know, you had Wilson giving updates. Um, so it came from many different political voices and sources. And they spoke, you know, the medical community and the public health community officials spoke from their knowledge bases. Um, that's a big difference. But these have always, you know, they've always, there's always been a political side to it. Um, I think just in the current environment, as I said, because of the 27, you know, 24 seven news cycle, um, that there's more um, political input, if you will, um, now. And we have to get that out of the way. So we have to, um, to look at this as, as the health crisis that it is. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time.